Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first Encore Live webisode. I'm your host, Robin Bell, and we are really excited to be here today. So, what is Encore Live? Encore Live brings industry leaders and Avery Dennison experts together in an engaging live format that's going to help you serve your customers with insights and services that will help you grow your business. We're going to have a Q&A at the end of the broadcast, but you can send those questions to us throughout this webisode and we'll address them at that time. In this first Encore Live webisode, we're gonna be talking to Eric Beaudry of the Rogers Corporation and Kyle Witham of Avery Dennison about the results of a bonding study featuring Rogers pour on industrial polyurethanes and Avery Dennison pressure sensitive adhesives. We're gonna go in depth with Mike Van Herens of Avery Dennison regarding the manufacturing of electric vehicles and we're gonna take a look at Avery Dennison's new electric vehicle portfolio, battery portfolio. So we're gonna begin our broadcast today with Steve Flannery, Vice President and General Manager of Avery Dennison Performance Tapes. Steve's gonna share some of the lessons learned in 2020 and what's ahead in 2021. And he's gonna share with us his views about the current state of the pressure sensitive adhesives industry including what you can expect from Avery Dennison in the year ahead. It's my pleasure to introduce Steve Flannery. Steve, it's good to have you with us today. Thanks, Robin. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm excited to speak to what I believe is over 100 folks, despite the fact that I can't see your faces. I'm really excited to, to have this conversation. So Yes, as am I, as am I. So let's get to it. Let's talk about some of the unique challenges of 2020. But before we do that, I understand you've got some exciting news for us. Yep, uh, we did announce uh, just a few weeks ago that we closed an acquisition of uh, JDC Solutions. Um, They're a, a relatively small tape manufacturer in Tennessee. They're a great company with a great reputation for quality and, and service. Um, they've been especially good at managing custom products and small MOQs, which is one of the reasons why, um, why we're interested and why we made the acquisition. Um, we believe they'll be a great complement to our performance tapes business here at Avery Dennison and really allow us to bring more value to our customers. Um, and one question that I get, I've gotten asked a couple of times now is, what's gonna change? Um, and broadly speaking, not much. Um, our goal is really to not create much disruption. So many of the things that you uh, like about uh, JDC today, we're not gonna be changing those things. In fact, um, we'd like to accentuate those and bring more value to our customer, customer base. Along with that, uh, they bring another location for us. So right now, um, Performance Tapes operates mainly out of Painesville, Ohio. This will bring another location down in Tennessee, which will allow us to expand um, uh, our flexibility and really to serve our customers as they grow and give us an opportunity to continue to expand um, as we grow in the marketplace. So all good, all good. So can you describe for us the advantages the JDC acquisition gives to Avery Dennison aside from location and some of the other things you've mentioned here? Yeah, uh, actually as a, probably a specific example I think is worth, I think is worth sharing. Um, so like I said, one of the the benefits that JDC brought to the table for us is being able to manage um, some of these low MOQ uh, uh, types of opportunities or types of types of business, um, which really give us an opportunity to better serve the marketplace. Well, uh, last year we launched with Performance Tapes a portfolio called the Core Series. Um, the Core Series is essentially a collection of products that are across a diverse set of chemistries as well as construction types, where our goal is to offer industry-leading MOQs, that is low MOQs, and industry-leading service. Um, and we, uh, the, one of the main reasons behind this acquisition was actually to uh, help us advance this strategic initiative for us um, and, and really allow us to deliver on the promise that we're, that we're putting out there to all of you, all of our customers around this core service portfolio. Um, so the, really the intent of this is to us to offer best-in-class um, service, that's dependable um, along with uh, low MOQs. And that the, the really the strategic intent of this JDC acquisition was all about growth, uh, not about cost cutting. So we see this as a real benefit to advancing um, our core series uh, product portfolio. 
So could you give us a specific example of the benefits that the acquisition offers to the customer? Sure. So um, as, as I mentioned, um, JDC was fairly strong in the converting channel. So the fact that we will be taking what is JDC's um, customer base along with ours will give us more scale um, and create more flexibility for us to, again, offer a broader set of products um, to our converting customers. So, um, and on top of that, allow us to continue to drive lower and lower MOQs, in particular for custom products. You may have experienced over the past few years MOQs that were just a little bit higher than you would have liked out of our Avery Dennison Performance Tapes facility. This will allow us to really lower our MOQ thresholds, in particular um, for custom products, which I think all of our customers will be happy to hear. Oh, absolutely. Uh, okay, let's talk about something else now. Let's talk about 2020. Unusual, unusual year by all accounts, right? Yeah. Can you tell us some of the lessons that were learned and how Avery Dennison addressed the demands on the business? Sure. Yeah, this was, uh, I think for all of us, a very bumpy year. Um, as, as I look back, though, um, sort of reflecting on this question, there are really three things that came to mind. One is bolder scenario planning. So many of you on the line today, I don't know how deeply you do scenario planning, looking at what is, you know, for example, 2021 going to look like. Um, that's something that we do on an annual basis. And um, candidly, we got the down right. So we knew we were going to see significant downturn as we uh, entered in particular the summer, and we saw that. Um, what we didn't expect and we missed was how fast it would rebound. Um, what we've seen and many of us are experiencing are volumes that are not just above, um, above uh, previous year's levels, but even above sort of pre-pandemic levels, and in some cases significantly above that. So I think one of the things that we've taken away as a learning is really to plan for uh, bolder scenarios. And in particular, what are the triggers for those scenarios? So what metrics or things would we want to look for that would cause us to then make a decision to go down one path versus another? So that's one learning that we took, that we took this year. I urge everyone to think about is be bolder with your scenario planning. Um, the second, which we're still we're still taking some learnings on this one, is I know most of us, um, especially in the tape industry, are have products that are specified. So you don't have a lot of wiggle room to make changes. When we hit an environment like this, it's really quickly understanding the difference between what can you change in an emergency versus what's impossible. So this is one thing we did several months ago. Is really looking at you know yes we have a whole bunch of products and components that um, are specced in and we really can't change. Um, but in an emergency, could we change them? And we separated that from components that are impossible to, to change, that there is no like product out there, even if the spec was opened up or a customer gave us a deviation and really understanding the differences and taking different behaviors and in particular, the things that are impossible to change, we built up some inventory of those items. So that way we know, even if we got into a pinch with some of the emergency items, it may be painful for the supply chain, but at least we could weather through the storm, even if it was painful. So I think that was learning number two, is really to understand the difference between very, very difficult to change versus truly unique, impossible, there is no near, near alternative. And then the third item, which um, I don't know if this will come as a surprise to most folks, most folks, but you know, anytime you run into an environment like this, you really realize just how important people and experience is. The mm -hmm. folks that have been in your business for 10, 15, 20 years, they've seen a lot. And when new things hit you or there's significant disruption, they are much more capable of being able to manage these new things because all the run the business type activity they've done for many, many years versus your less experienced, you know, let's say zero to five year folks, it becomes real upheaval and you lose a lot of that historical knowledge that may save you when you run into a situation where you've got to make changes or, or run on the fly and you need to rely on your instincts. Those 15, 20 year people have a lot of deep instincts embedded in how they do the business. So one thing that we've really learned is how invaluable those experienced people are and we're actually putting, um, putting some more emphasis both on A, retaining those folks and B, thinking about how do we ensure that we have promotional processes and um, we're creating development opportunities for those folks that have been here for a while to keep them with us for another five, 10, 20, 20 years. How important that's been in particular in turbulent times like this. That's I think probably what I would say, some insights. 
Well, this, all of these uh, points that you hit on are great lessons to have learned, very valuable lessons to, uh, to take away from 2020. So let's take a look at uh, 2021. We're nearing the end of the first quarter of 2021. Can you share with us some of the insights and industry projections for 2021? Sure, and I, I, I'll, I'll start up by saying I don't know if these are um, super insightful, they're just what we're thinking about. So I, I imagine many people on the line are, already know some of these. I'll just at least give you my perspective. Um, so one is, as you can imagine, com, uh, continued demand volatility. Um, you know, many of our customers and customers' customers and even customers' customers' customers are still trying to figure out what is the right uh, inventory position. How much safety, safety stock should they have? Should they be switching suppliers, more domestic supply? So there's a lot of um, volatility in the supply chain we believe will continue for many months as many of our customers and OEM customers are still trying to figure out what does their new supply chain look like and what should their inventory positions be. So I, I would say we should expect for 2021 continued um, extreme demand volatility, along with just, again, sort of your standard uh, um, you know, bullwhip effect as inventories got depleted, they're you know, refilling them and then they'll realize they filled it up too much. And so sort of a typical bullwhip effect. So we're, we're planning on that continuing for the, for the balance of the year. Um, one of the things that actually concerns me a bit is just the health of the US economy. So again, I'm sure many of you who look at the news, there's pretty wild projections everywhere from 4% growth in the US to 8 plus percent growth in the US and GDP which could have a lot of implications depending on what, what end of that spectrum we're in. Um, our belief is over the last 12 months or so, even though most people were in lockdown, there was quite a bit of goods being purchased. So you had a lot of durable goods, which is a lot of tapes going to durable goods. I think what we're gonna see moving forward here is services really surge, um, which is gonna put just significant strain on the workforce. So again, as labor becomes tighter and tighter, I think there's a big concern for inflation. So I think many of you are already experiencing that today and just some of the raw materials, but I think that's gonna permeate through the entire US economy if it heats up you know, in that plus 6% GDP um, scenario that many economists are beginning to, to throw around here. Um, so I think that's something we should all be prepared for and how do we manage through that? Um, and then with that, again, I talked about labor being short. Materials are gonna to continue to be short. So Avery Dennison is thankfully backward integrated um, in adhesives, which gives us pretty, pretty powerful insight into some of the basic chemical components that go into PSA adhesives. Um, and those have been tight in some cases, in particular, the weather event that happened down in Texas, which was almost a month ago now, is still causing significant disruptions in some of the chemical feedstocks that go into adhesives. And we don't expect that to, um, to abate for, for probably several months now as the supply chain continues to recover um, and different components are recovering it at different states. Um, talked about labor, and then I think transportation, again, is one that we're all seeing right now, and in particular, as the service economy starts to surge back, um, I think we're gonna again see continued shortness in transportation, in particular labor around transportation, which is gonna cause inflation and just downright shortages of being able to get, whether it be trucks, containers, tank wagons, um, you name it, it's gonna be just difficult to actually get um, transportation set up to move our products around, around the country. Um, thankfully, Avery Dennison is fairly well poised to manage that, but it is absolutely a concern for the entire industry. Yeah, yeah, it is. We're, we're, we're still learning as we go, aren't we, Steve? Sort Absolutely. of the name of the game. Well, I want to thank you for this. This was really insightful. This was great information for our viewers. And, and again, thank you, Steve. Appreciate okay. your time. Thank you, and thank you, everyone who's online. And I'll be around for, for questions at, at the end as well. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Steve. Now, just a quick reminder, at the end of the webisode today, uh, we're going to have a Q&A, uh, so you can send your questions throughout the broadcast, uh, and we'll see them and, and, and address those later on. Avery Dennison recently created a series of bonding studies to help you with the adhesive selection process and the technical requirements that your customers may need. Today, we're going to take a look at the bonding study that features Rogers Poron Industrial Polyurethanes and specifies the Avery Dennison Core Series portfolio that pairs with Poron materials to meet our customers' performance requirements. 
With us today to discuss that bonding study is Eric Beaudry, Senior Technical Service and Development Engineer with Rogers Corporation, and Kyle Witham, Product Development Engineer with Avery Dennison. Welcome to Encore Live, gentlemen. Good to have you here today. Let's dive right in. So this is a fascinating study. Eric, uh, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about the Rogers Corporation and the pour on industrial polyurethanes. But before you do, can you tell us what is an industrial polyurethane? Uh, certainly. Thanks, Robin. Thanks for the, the entire Avery Dennison team for having, uh, having us be a part of this. Um, so high performance polyurethanes, particularly in the industrial space, are uh, high performance, open cell, micro microcellular polyurethane foams. Um, these are built on very specific proprietary formulations, right, designed around a very specific set of CTQs established to solve a very specific set of customer uh, potential issues, right? We consider these pinnacle products uh, used in a whole host of applications, whether gasket, general gasketing and sealing, uh, water sealing, vibration impact mitigation, uh, medical, sensing, uh, thermal management and insulation. Uh, and people really choose the products because they provide high performance uh, over the life cycle of the application. So uh, a little background on poron polyurethanes and kind of what they are. That, that's really helpful. Uh, I want to send this next question to you, Kyle. What was being tested in the bonding study and what was the methodology used in that testing? Thanks, Robin. So what we did was we took a look at Avery Dennison core series materials. So Steve touched on it a little bit on his section, but we have our core series and that's where we did most of our work in this study. Now, on top of that, we do take a little extra look at the same time across our portfolio to check and see if we have any products that we think are a good fit for the material that we're testing or that we think maybe there would be a benefit in adding to the core series. Okay. Now, how we tested the materials, uh, we tested in two different scenarios here. In both cases, what we're doing is we are laminating our adhesive to the Rogers Poron material. And in both cases, we're using the same compression settings as well, as well as letting them rest for 72 hours to achieve that full bonding potential. The difference between the two sets is we looked at a room temperature lamination as well as a heated lamination. Now our heated lamination was at 220 degrees Fahrenheit, which is right around where we typically recommend heated laminations occur. The reason that we took a look at both of these is that we know that not all of our customers have heat laminating capabilities, but for those that do, it is almost always a benefit to heat laminate your pressure sensitive adhesive. Okay, okay, that's that's good information. Um, let's talk about the poron information, the poron materials that were used in this. Eric, would you uh, would you tell us about the poron materials? And this is a great chart, by the way, uh, for our viewers to take a look at. Yeah, so this is kind of a breakdown of the industrial product family as a whole, uh, which consists of kind of our legacy products. So the Poron 4701, 30, 40, 50, 60 products, right? Those are our general gasketing and sealing materials used in, you know, any and every application under the sun. Um, we have our Aquapro uh, 4701, 37, and 41 products, which are uh, slightly different from a formulation perspective. Uh, have unique characteristics around water sealing, and then our energy management products are 4790, 92, and 79 products uh, for impact and vibration mitigation. So it's a nice mix of the entire uh, portfolio uh, relative to what's kind of utilized in industry. Yeah, this is a great mix. Uh, Kyle, let's talk about the core series adhesive families that were tested, and also if you would uh, tell us how the performance was rated. Yep, thanks Robin. So the adhesive families that we tested ran across all of our portfolio uh, of course series and we can kind of see it on the screen right now. 
So we have products ranging from general purpose rubbers to general purpose acrylics, all the way over to more of our specialty lines, something like HPA or our high performance acrylic. Now, the, the way that we evaluated these was on a good, better, best kind of scale. And to try to help to give some semblance of what that means, at the good level, uh, what we typically saw was some foam tear with a heated lamination. Now, as we get into the better and best, we see more and more of those products shift to being able to achieve foam tear at a room temperature lamination. Mm, yeah, this I, this chart is great. I love this, and this information is great. We've got time for one more question. Would you both briefly tell us what the key takeaways were from this study for the customer? And Eric, why don't we start with you to answer this question? Yeah, so I would say um, for us, uh, the majority of the product consumed in market leverages some sort of bonding system, right? So whether tape or otherwise, um, this unique study really lets us dive into the uniqueness of the material properties required to ensure we're utilizing the right tapes in industry uh, to provide customers good engineered solutions for their specific product problems, right? So the, I think the study does a great job at detailing out the specifics. As Kyle mentioned, the good, better, best model is a great way to understand uh, how ultimately it'll affect uh, material inclusion in your application. So. Yeah, again, I want to refer to the to that chart. It, it really is a good uh, model to use, good, better, and best. And I'm going to ask you, Kyle, if you give me your, your key takeaways from this uh, bonding study. Yeah, so I think that one of the most important things that we've learned from this, and Eric touched on it, is it is a great learning experience for each of our companies as we come together and we learn more about, for us, foams that have been used in industry, and like Eric said for him, tapes. Uh, it's through this kind of joint learnings that we're actually able to boost the knowledge level of everyone involved and help make sure that we're making the right tape recommendations for the materials used. And on top of that, another great takeaway for me is I mentioned earlier how on top of our core series product lines, we also like to take a look internally at some of our other options. Well, for this study in particular, we noticed that one of our product lines was actually the best performer. Now that's the FBA 1115 and 8315 that you see down there at the bottom, or what we're calling our new pure acrylic family. This is a product line that we've kind of had for a while, but maybe just escaped notice it, and was undervalued for how well it performed in foam bonding applications. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, I have to say that uh, I was looking at some of the uh, chat going on. The, your your chart is a winner with with uh, with everybody. And speaking of winner. Rogers and Avery Dennison certainly are making it easier for customers to do business. Eric and Kyle, thank you very much for this really interesting interview. Now you can get more information on this study and others at tapes.averydennison.com. And during the webisode, you can find this address in chat. Just a quick note before our next guest joins us, Kyle and his team are wrapping up a bonding study featuring armacell materials. Now, this bonding study will be ready in Q2. Electric vehicles are making headlines with large automakers like GM and Ford, and they're setting aggressive timelines around electric vehicle manufacturing and adoption. These headlines are impacting the pressure-sensitive adhesive industry. And here's some exciting news. Avery Dennison has just announced the launch of their electric vehicle battery tape portfolio. Joining us today to give us an in-depth look at the manufacturing of electric vehicles and to share some insights into the new Avery Dennison EV battery portfolio is Mike Van Herent, Automotive Business Development Manager of Avery Dennison. Mike, welcome to Encore Live. Glad you could be here with us today. Thanks, Robin. It's good to speak with you again. Yeah, you as well. Electric vehicles, 
They're all over the news. Everybody wants information on EVs. What information should customers be paying attention to so that they can prepare for these new innovations impacting their businesses? Well, this is an exciting space for Avery Dennison. Um, since we launched this portfolio in February, we've had a ton of engagement from converters, different customers, uh, and OEMs, um, and we're continuing to grow in this space. If we start to look at the current market conditions that you're seeing on your screen right now, 2021, we're looking at about 3% global market share. Uh, not terribly large uh, across the globe, but as we look at the uh, combined annual growth rate for 2025, we're looking at 9.5% roughly, and then by 2030, roughly 22%, if we're just looking at the electric vehicle portion of, uh, of that graph and excluding the plug-in hybrid. So one would ask, well, what's driving, what's driving these electric vehicles, right? Well, there's two really uh, primary drivers. So you have some global policy initiatives being put forth by different government agencies, and then technological uh, improvements. First off, let's talk about policy. So global CO2 emissions are really driving a lot of this initial growth. Starting off in North America, we have the, our new administration here with the new green, <clears throat> excuse me, new green deal initiative. So uh, 2030, we're, they're trying to put in 500,000 charging units nationwide up from the current 90,000 uh, units that are available today. Um, our US government fleet has 650,000 vehicles and they're gonna be moving to an all electric fleet moving forward. And then finally, the Department of Energy is trying to source more rare earth materials and minerals for electric vehicle construction one to strategically uh, shore up our domestic supply, and the other is to have less reliance on overseas importation of those, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, raw materials. And then outside of North America, but we'll look at Europe. In 2020, during all of the wonderful COVID crisis, um, they, they also implemented new CO2 regulations uh, requiring that your light vehicle uh, fleets have to basically uh, achieve a 57 mile per gallon fleet average, which is very difficult to do with traditional internal combustion engines. So uh, with that, we've seen a huge increase in electric vehicle uh, implementation there, and they're potentially moving to start banning internal combustion engines by 2030 in Europe. Internal combustion engines, wow, right? 500,000 500, charging stations, that's the goal. And uh, 300 miles, is it? Uh, uh, hopefully 300 miles between charges. That would, yeah. be, uh, that would be impressive, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, that, uh, as I mentioned, the second driver of all this, Robin, is that you have technology. Um, the 2022 vehicles and beyond are, are hopefully going to be achieving a 300 mile uh, per charge distance. And then you also have this cost parity, which some people, including myself, didn't really understand when this initial number was, was put out, but $100 per kilowatt hour is the cost parity that the Department of Energy and many industry experts believe that achieves the same price of an electric vehicle versus an internal combustion engine. Mm. So if we look at the, the map we have up here on the screen, um, we're already starting to see some of these policy initiatives that I've previously previously spoken about. We have California banning internal combustion engines by 2035 for new vehicle sales. Washington State doing the same by 2030. And British Columbia, Canada uh, by 2040. In addition, I've also recently heard that uh, Massachusetts may be proposing a ban, although not passed yet, um, by 2030 also. And then what does that mean for uh, vehicle manufacturers? Well, General Motors has said that they're gonna be all electric by 2035. And Volvo has said that they're going to be all electric globally by 2030. So we're seeing a lot of movement in this space. Yeah, there's definitely loads of interest in electric vehicles. Um, something I want to talk about, if we could, what are the most common challenges in uh, battery design and construction? So really, um, I mean, besides how Avery Dennison really, how we address these, the common challenges that the industry fights are a couple. Um, you have occupant protection and safety, uh, things like thermal runaway events, fires. I mean, if, if you've seen any YouTube fires of, of specific electric vehicles catching fire, it's a pretty catastrophic event. So trying to keep those occupants safe and protected. 
um, packaging constraints. Uh, everyone wants longer range vehicles so that their electric vehicle would be almost the same type of range as what their internal combustion uh, gasoline or diesel powered vehicles move today. And there's a lot of packaging constraints to try and achieve those type of capacities. And then you have heat management, um, both during using the vehicle and driving and then quick charging. Uh, quick charging generates a tremendous amount of heat, especially as you start to go above 150 kilowatt hours of charging. Uh, so you could do a five or 10 minute charge on your battery. There's a ton of heat generated and then trying to manage that heat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's that certainly is a is a challenge. So, talking about electric vehicle batteries, why is this an opportunity for pressure sensitive tapes? Well, I mean, first off, pressure sensitive tapes are amazing materials, but I may have a biased opinion on that. <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> maybe a little. <laughs> so this 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 opportunity uh, or this portfolio offers a lot of opportunities to our customers in addition to our regular portfolio products, right? So. Inside of this space, we have laminates of various materials, uh, functional materials, requiring pressure sensitive adhesives in their construction. And the primary driver there being that they offer immediate tack and adhesion, something that a lot of other adhesives don't have to offer. And the, you know, what are these functional materials that are typically being bonded? Well, we have cell compression pads that go between prismatic and pouch cells to allow expansion contraction mm -hmm. during charging and discharging. We have thermal runaway materials that, like I had mentioned before, are protecting us, the occupants of that vehicle, from catastrophic fire or thermal events. We have things such as thermal gap pads, not to be confused with what I just mentioned, that are helping pull the heat out of those battery cells and into uh, chiller plates or other cooling medium. And then we also have a lot of these materials are just very difficult to bond to. They're fibrous, ceramics, micas, or low surface energy materials like silicon foams, um, all of which are just very difficult to bond. So with that, uh, PSAs offer uh, tapes for those protection and safety uh, while still bonding these functional materials, primarily in two areas, the dielectric protection tapes that stop uh, electrical arcing, and then protecting these flame materials like I had mentioned before. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's, that's how I would answer that question. <laughs> good answer. Very good answer, Mike. All right, here's something I want to finish up with. The electric vehicle battery portfolio. Very exciting, right? Specifically, I want to know how does this portfolio address the challenges in this market and the opportunities for our viewers to enter into or to grow within this segment? So we have, uh, the graphic that we have up here on the screen, um, we have, eight primary uh, applications that we list that are really our primary focal items. Um, within those, there's a couple underlying themes that, that reign, uh, that are very resident. Um, the dielectric performance, uh, trying to stop electrical conductivity between materials, uh, the thermal and flame management, and then just protection of these uh, materials. So those are kind of the overarching themes of a lot of the products that we sell into this space. Of these constructions, we have single coated and double coated and transfer tape materials, much like a lot of our other portfolio of adhesive products. We have different acrylic and silicone chemistries we're using in this space that optimize the bond, bondability of the substrates with the performance of shear and tack and strength that are needed for the application. And then we're combining all of that with functional films. Some of those are flame retardant, some of those are dielectric, and there's a variety of other uh, products as well. And then the portfolio that we're, that we're offering here today is ever evolving. Um, as new requirements from OEMs uh, continue to come forth, uh, we're gonna continue innovating. This is our generation one of this portfolio. And we're gonna, you know, a year or two from now, we may have additional products that we're offering in this space just because of the continued growth in the, uh, in the electric vehicle industry and, and the evolution of engineering occurring within it. Hmm. You know, it's, um... It's really an exciting time. Electric vehicles, this is a very exciting, you know, it's kind of like the Jetsons have arrived, right? <laughs> well, this was fascinating and this was fun. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us today, Mike. Thank you, Robin. And I just wanted to also mention that we're going to be giving a uh, EV battery webinar this summer uh, in 2021. 
um, for those of uh, you who would like to join, we'll be announcing those details in the future. Yes, and we're going to be sending out an email soon to let everybody know when that webinar will take place, and you'll get some information on signing up for that event. Again, thanks, Mike. Now, before we open this up to Q&As, I want to let you know our next Encore Live webisode is going to take place on June 17th. You're going to be able to register through our Encore e-newsletter, LinkedIn, or you can register through email. All right, let's open this up to some questions. And by the way, if we can't get to all the questions, you can go ahead and reach out to your account reps. All right, let's see, what have we got here? Okay, so here's a question. This one, it looks like this one is, oh, this one might be for you, Eric. What's the difference between the bonding studies and core series selection tool? Oh, I think that one is me, Robin, oh, but I'll, right. I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> so. Oh yes, I see that, okay. So the difference <laughs> between the bonding study and our product selection tool, at a high level, uh, for those of you familiar with the product selection tool, you know that our course series kind of follows four simple steps. The bonding study can be thought of as a deeper dive into that first step. We're really focused on the lamination material here and try to kind of give some insight here. Eric talked a little bit about how important his specialty foams are, right? Rogers creates very specialty materials. What we are finding out in the course of our bonding studies is that our more generic uh, categorization of materials sometimes fails to capture some of the nuance in that those specialty materials. So I think from that perspective, the bonding studies offer a deeper insight into a specific laminating material category. Okay, uh, you know what? We've got a lot of questions coming in here. This one is for you, Mike. EV battery applications. Do you already have approvals from battery producers and actual suppliers? So right now, uh, Robin, where uh, the approvals that we're really working towards are UL94V type uh, requirements. Uh, our adhesives, both acrylic and silicone, uh, combined with specific face stocks, are meeting the UL94V-0 flame requirement. Um, as far as OEM requirements, they're uh, mostly asking for that level of flame resistance. The actual OEM specifications for the battery and battery integrators are typically uh, functional performance tests that our materials need to meet in conjunction with a variety of other materials. So there really isn't a specific OEM spec for these materials other than the UL uh, certification and classification, uh, is, which is a testing protocol. Okay, and there is another question about, I'm gonna uh, stay with you for just a moment here. Is there a particular material specification for an electric battery application? I guess, um, in addition to, to, I don't know if I'm gonna answer this question correctly, but in addition to the UL specification that I mentioned, uh, we do have a, a, a whole chart of our internal specifications or internal uh, part numbers that we have for this space. I don't know what the what the audience member is specifically asking for in that. If they want to provide any additional clarification, I'd be happy to answer it. But we have about uh, 15 different products that go into this portfolio right now from a specification perspective. Uh, 10, roughly 10 of which are UL 94V-0 uh, certified uh, in a test in accordance with that certification. All right, so we've just gotten a question for you, Steve. Uh, how can we, as converters, work with Avery Dennison to help offset the current supply issues? Good question. Yes, I figured I'd get a hardball question. Um, <laughs> and so, you like those hardball questions. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I mentioned it. The entire industry right now is, is in a tough spot from a supply standpoint uh, across many components, in particular right now, some of the chemical components. Um, I would say... If there's an ask or, you know, what could you do? One is, you know, continued patience. Um, you know, in many cases, at least from, from our standpoint, you know, we are 
in some cases, there'll be a delivery we might be expecting of a specific component, you know, tomorrow that we'd want to use in the manufacturing of products a few days later. And it's a confirmed delivery and it just doesn't show up. <clears throat> um, and we're having to sort of change over our whole schedule, which those of you who know, coating of laminate materials is very difficult um, to just disrupt a coating schedule and coating wheel. Um, so I would, I just, the first and foremost is just ask for patience. And the second is um, make sure you have uh, some really candid conversations with your contact, your sales contact point with Avery Dennison. I think this, this goes for any supplier, but in particular for this one with us in terms of exactly what your needs are so that we can make sure that we're fulfilling um, those needs while still trying to balance out um, what's going on from a supply chain standpoint. And I hate to say it, but the, in most cases, either force majeure allocation or just limited supply of some of the raw materials um, that we uh, need for the manufacturing of pressure sensitive materials. Yeah, yeah. Um, this goes out to another question about EV battery applications. What are the typical thicknesses of the tapes that are utilized in the uh, electric vehicle battery applications? Um, I guess. Uh... Typically, if like if we're talking about a double coated type tape, we're usually using a one to two mil, uh, and I'm going to use all English units here, a one or two mil carrier. Um, typically, with somewhere in the two to three mil of coat weight, uh, but a lot of that is dependent on what we're trying to bond to. The fibrous materials can have coat weights as high as five mils, just depending on um, the. Uh, complexity of the fiber orientation and, and the porosity of the material. And then we can, we get down into one and a half or two mil coat weights when we're bonding to much more standard aluminums and, and higher surface energy type uh, uh, products. So those, those typically cal calipers of thickness and carriers are, are what we look, we're looking at. And then on single, on the single coated side, um, about the same, but one or two to two mils uh, of product unless they have very specific requirements and Avery Dennison Performance Tapes is always, is always willing to work with uh, companies on individual uh, specifications and requirements and we can custom make those products if necessary. Uh, okay, this is back to you, Steve. Back to you, Steve. Uh, is there, um, there was a question about uh, supply chain mm -hmm. um, and it looks like we just lost it, but, it, but when do you see, foresee it is the, uh, is, yeah, is, it, when do you first see the supply chain improving? This is a good question. This is one that we're racking our brains on right now. So um, it's difficult to say with respect to how hot does the economy get um, throughout this year. So um, I think from a COVID standpoint, I, I'd, I'd like to think that we're, we're getting beyond that. Even ourselves, um, we're seeing very few COVID cases now. And the, the impacts of that on uh, the workforce, I think, is getting smaller and smaller every day that goes by. So I, I think that that's becoming less and less of an event moving forward here. The bigger issue that we've got is just material constraints. So <clears throat> it, it depends on the chemicals uh, that are involved. So obviously, all of us uh, in some way, shape or form, either through us or directly are buying pressure sensitive materials. And in particular, some of the chemical components were, again, significantly impacted. If you didn't um, hear or see, BASF, a number of other of the component manufacturers announced force majeures and or allocations on um, 2A, 2EHA, BA, which are basically the backbone of most polymers that go into pressure sensitive adhesives. Those, I think we expect to start to see some um, catching up of what was essentially a depleted supply chain um, towards, the end of, towards the end of April. Um, as we go into May, we believe that that will start to rebound, um, but it's going to be tight for I would say through the through the month of April. And on top of that, you just have individual components that are becoming tight because of, again, I talked about this volatility in the supply chain. It's, uh, you know, again, some smaller components uh, are becoming short and making it difficult for us to, to procure. Um, but we believe, again, as we get towards the end of April, I think we're gonna see sort of a, a relax or a more of a steady state um, in some of these raw material feedstocks. Having said that, I think we're going to continue to see volatility throughout the balance of this year um, as all the components, whether they be paper, liners, filmic materials, um, along with some of the chemical feedstocks are going to be, it's going to be, um, it's going to be a bumpy year, I would say. But I think the bulk of it, we should start to see some, le some lightening up here as we uh, exit April. 
Yeah, and again, I think the, these are challenges that we have to uh, the, that we have to deal with. But it is, I, I agree, it is lightening up. Eric, there was a question that came for you. What separates Poron from other foams in the industry? Uh, great question, Robin. So I would say, from a performance perspective, you've got kind of two primary things, right? Um, I'd like to think we're really good at working to understand the specific nature of the problems which we're trying to solve, right? So I had mentioned earlier, we don't do uh, one size fits all solution uh, for, you know, customer problems, right? Our materials are um, pretty diverse from a portfolio perspective, not unlike every denizens. Um, so we really have a plethora of products designed around providing, um, you know, specific solutions to specific problems. So I would say that's probably the first primary one. Um, the second being uh, general performance as a whole. So uh, product performance happens to be the number one criteria for us, right? We're certainly not the cheapest, uh, nor do we play in that space. Um, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is provide a customer a solution that uh, solves their problem for the entire life cycle of the program in which their products exist out uh, in the field, right? So um, longevity, longevity of performance is critical for us. And I would say the, the, the makeup of the product um, is built around supporting just that, right? So I think that's probably the primary um, high level differentiation against many other products in industry. Okay, um, you know, we are we're running pretty short on time, but there, I'm, I'm gonna uh, throw out one more, uh, one more question. Do you see the EV battery portfolio growing as more and more emphasis put on this space? Mike? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Robin. Um, we're, already, <laughs> we're already working on a couple generation two products uh, based on customer VOCs, voice of customer. Um, that we've uh, received already. Um, so yeah, it is continuing to evolve as we speak today. Uh, 2022, uh, or even sooner, may have additional products that we'll be commercializing into the portfolio. Okay, well this was great. I really appreciate all of you spending time with us today. Um, this was a lot of fun. After the webisode, we are gonna send out a brief, um, a brief survey. Take a moment, provide your feedback regarding today's webisode. We really would appreciate that. Until next time, I'm Robin Bell, and this was Avery Dennison's Performance Tapes Encore Live.